Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar sponsored by the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. We've called it tonight, um, the National Bank, the National Infrastructure Bank Alternative to Congressional Economic Dysfunction. So you all have seen the, the headlines, Congress unable to pass a budget, the United States $30 trillion in US government debt, we need to do something different, but the extreme partisanship that we have in Congress gets in the way. So tonight we will explore how a national infrastructure bank can help change that dynamic. My name is Julie Olson. I'm the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers here tonight for you. And we have the honor of hearing prepared remarks from Congresswoman Delia Ramirez, who is an Illinois co-sponsor of our proposed legislation, HR 4052. So let's go right to Congresswoman Ramirez. Hi everyone, I'm Congresswoman Delia Ramirez, and I have the honor to represent the incredibly diverse Illinois third congressional district. As you can see this week, I am back in D.C., ready to debate once again another congressional budget and the priorities of our government. Intentionally investing in safe, resilient infrastructure for our communities is one of those priorities. You see, investing in our infrastructure is an investment in the safety and well-being of our communities, the economic development of our region, and as you know, thriving futures for our families. That is why I'm so proud to co-sponsor the National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2023, sponsored by my fellow Chicago representative, Congressman Danny Davis, and pushed forward by all of you here today. The legislation builds on the historic investments made in our communities by the bipartisan infrastructure law, and to this date, has delivered $14.6 billion to the state of Illinois for the development of over 380 specific projects. The National Infrastructure Bank Act ensures the projects in Illinois and throughout our nation keep growing by creating a five trillion, yes I said trillion, dollars permanent public bank to invest only in infrastructure projects. Five trillion that would allow us to tackle all the backlog of accumulated projects and build a resilient, safe, high quality infrastructure for our nation. The list of needed projects just in Illinois is very large. We have over a million lead water service lines that must be replaced to protect the health of our communities. 9% of our bridges located mainly in rural communities are in dire need of repairs. The affordable housing shortage is severe and only getting worse to combat the crisis. We need enough financing so that we can build at least 300,000 new units. I said it, 300,000 new units. My city of Chicago and the suburban parts of my district are desperately in need of funding to expand our rail system and address rail road security concerns that protect our families, our environment, and our infrastructure. And that's why I'm on board with Congressman Danny Davis, my fellow Illinois colleague, and other members who are co-sponsoring this effort. And I hope many others will join us and help us bring our infrastructure to the 21st century. I want to thank the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank for having me. Let's keep pushing this legislation forward until it passes both chambers, gets signed into law. Let's make infrastructure possible throughout the nation. I'm sure you'll agree with me that Congresswoman Ramirez is an excellent communicator, and we are so thrilled to have her on board as a co-sponsor. So um, really appreciate her making those remarks and uh, we're certain she'll be awesome uh, in, as far as furthering our, our mission with the National Infrastructure Bank. So here's a lineup of the rest of the speakers you'll be hearing from this evening. Uh, we've got quite a few people, uh, learned folks that we'd like to hear from tonight. And so without any further ado, we are gonna get with it. Our first speaker is a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and is now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeca, you're on stage. 
Thank you very much and welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a great crowd this evening. It's nice to see all of you, some old faces, some new faces. My name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist. I worked for 25 years at the International Monetary Fund and now I'm on the NIB board advising on this National Infrastructure Bank proposal. So uh, and, and, and to set up the other speakers for this evening, I'd like to give you an update on where we are on the bill and where we are on the economy. So with regard to the bill, we're doing great. I mean, with all of the help from all of our grassroots coalition, we are now up to 27 co-sponsors on the bill, uh, including the main sponsor, Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois. The way that we brought on a lot of these sponsors is to go to legislative offices, talk to state and local offices, including city councils and that kind of thing, talk to uh, the regional uh, representatives about their unmet infrastructure needs, and then go collectively to the to their members of Congress and ask them to sign on the bill. That's been a winning formula, uh, and we want to continue that. And we, that's why we have Zoom calls like this to let you know where we are, where we are, where we have grassroots campaigns working. If you want to join, uh, we're apps, you know, with any state campaigns or even nationally, uh, our you know our grassroots campaign is really making a big difference here. So that's where we are on the bill. Uh, where we are on the economy, it's stable for now. Uh, GDP growth uh, was, you know, sort of higher than expected in the fourth quarter of last year. However, it is buoyed mostly by consumer spending and government spending. For those of you who ever took an economics course 101, uh, with the first thing they would have taught you is that everything we produce in the economy, our GDP, is bought by someone, either consumers, which is our what they call C, or government spending, or uh, investment by uh, private companies to add to their you know, capital stock, their machinery, and all that kind of stuff, or it's bought by people overseas, exported, and then, of course, we have to take off imports because uh, that comes under the consumption category, but it's not produced in the in the country. So it, if we have the whole thing bo bolstered by consumer and government spending, what does that mean? How did it happen? It happened by them running up more debt, which in the in the long run is not sustainable. Consumers, for example, increasingly put their spending on their credit cards, interest rates, of course, credit card interest rates are 21% and uh, the government is uh, running up big deficits uh, and interest on that debt is now blown out uh, to record levels. So altogether, not sustainable. GDP has softened and slowed a little bit, uh, but core inflation, that is the excluding food and fuel, which the which is what the Fed tracks, is still running around 4%. That's twice the Fed policy level. And people are not feeling this generally good, quote, good economy. 40% of Americans are complaining about it, say it's not good. Uh, and the reason being that they know from their pocketbooks that inflation over the last three years has gone up 20%, but their pay has only gone up 15%. So uh, they're still behind the eight ball. And a, a, a section, an important section of our lowest income earners are seriously struggling with rising rents, dwindling rental assistance coming from the budget, increasing evictions, high food and car insurance and healthcare costs. They can't pay their bills. So this is the, uh, really a, a segment of the economy uh, that the National Infrastructure Bank will help. Fed is keeping interest rates high for the time being. The conference board of um, economists uh, still expects that um, there might be a slowdown in the economy in the first half of this year, maybe 1% growth in the second half. The leading indicators, including manufacturing, are still down. And meanwhile, banks are under serious stress. Probably no me, no me Prince will talk about this, but uh, their, their profit profitabilities are upside down because of the high interest rates. They have a lot of bad debt on their bank, on their books, uh, especially regional banks with real estate bad loans and wobbly derivatives like uh, um, commercial mortgage-backed securities that could go bad and are easy to walk away from. We could still have a banking crisis. So that's where we are in the economy. Where are we on the budget? <laughs> it's a little bit of a, it looks like a clown show, <laughs> but there are structural reasons for why it is so. In the first place, we have very high debt now. 
Uh, this is the plot of what our debt as a ratio to GDP looks like over the last you know, century or so. And you can see that it got very, very high at the end of World War II. It came down dramatically. I'll talk about more about that in a minute. And now it is just shooting up, like astronomically shooting up. And the reasons are because of the 2008 recession and bailing out the banks, and then because of the COVID recession and bailing that out. And now we have a structural deficit problem with uh, mandatory spending. So uh, all of those are reasons for the debt. Uh, but you'll notice um, that uh, the on the and so it, it, it's attributable to two things. On the spending side, the annual budget, this is a picture of what your tax dollars go for. Everybody should pay the, their annual, you know, it's come, we're going into tax season now. Uh, they pay their taxes. They should know what they're paying their taxes on. Uh, they are paying their taxes on a whole bunch of items that cannot be controlled in the budget. These are called mandatory spending items, including Social Security, health care, some other things, and then interest on the national debt, which comes from over here. And then the things that they can control, uh, it's just this segment of the pie chart, which is defense spending and the rest of the discretionary spending. And within this rest of the discretionary spending, uh, there is only, which is only about 11% of all the spending. Uh, this is the thing that they fight over. They normally quickly agree on defense spending. They've agreed on that over the last year, but uh, this, this pocket right here is the thing that they're fighting over. And uh, it's a structural deficit problem. So um, in addition to that, uh, Democrats uh, want agreed to reduce this by about 250 billion provided that they get more, 100 billion more over this pocket over here just to spend on Ukraine and uh, is Israel aid. Um, the Republicans, of course, want to lower taxes. Uh, the, the one thing that's not shown on this pie chart is something called tax expenditures, which is the uh, deductions and credits and things that happen when you pay your taxes, but they are netted off the revenues that come into the budget. That's that's $1.5 trillion per year. We call them tax expenditures. They're never discussed in the budget. Uh, and of course, Republicans want to uh, cut taxes more, but so far all these exemptions uh, mostly benefit very high income earners and something to think about in when we restructure our budget. And then we've got a third problem, which is that corporate lobbyists are coming in trying to push up defense spending, push up healthcare spending by uh, preventing uh, negotiations on, for example, pharmacy prices, uh, trying to gut budgets of the Internal Revenue Service, the Environmental Protection Agency, and bank regulators. So all those are players in the budget. It looks like a very chaotic process, but there are structural reasons behind why we are now, this week, we uh, passed or, or are passing, I think as of today, our fourth continuing resolution to agree on this year's budget, which started in October, and we still haven't uh, come up with a plan for how we're going to spend our money this year. So what can we do about this? Uh, our our big uh, suggestion is that we use an off-budget national infrastructure bank to finance infrastructure, which at the same time will really recharge the whole economy. It's the best policy for controlling debt in the long run. Why? Because this kind of investment will double GDP growth from about two and a half percent, which has been over the last decade, to up to five and a half percent over the coming decade, a doubling GDP growth uh, will all be done with an off-budget entity that adds zero to the national debt. And in addition to that, it has all kinds of bonuses. For example, it'll bring in more federal and state revenues. It'll reduce poverty. It'll reach the working poor, provide great paying jobs, and bring people back into the middle class. And the example of the Rate Construction Finance Corporation, which I've pointed to uh, on previous occasions, uh, is an example of how you can have very high debt, you can't finance uh, getting out of this problem through uh, increasing debt further, and you can use an off-budget uh, bank to finance your infrastructure. And it will fix, then if we do all of that, we can 
fix the structural budget deficit problems like uh, mandatory spending, like the tax structure, like corporate influence and that kind of thing. We can fix all of those things with a little less pain and argumentation. But the, the great thing is that in this leap year, on this leap day, we can build, instead of leaping across this big divide here, and it looks pretty scary, we can build a permanent bridge, a permanent body, an institution that will finance infrastructure over the long haul without budget uh, you know, um, shenanigans going on and get serious about rebuilding our country and our workforce. Infrastructure for all, jobs, great paying jobs for all, uh, fix the economy at the same time we fix our infrastructure. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Elfeka. I love that analogy of instead of leaping, we need to build a bridge. So, right. uh, yeah, <laughs> so very good. Uh, okay, uh, now we have all the way from Los Angeles, California, author and former managing director of Goldman Sachs, Dr. Nomi Prinz. Nomi, you're muted. Every Hi. time. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, Julie. I, I, I love that slide with the, the little person in between like the two chasms and sort of leaping over the, um, the, the budget impasse, because the alternative to that is basically plummeting to like certain death. And, and I think what we're trying to say here is that, you know, we are creating a solution that, um, allows us to finance ourselves out of that, um, you know, potential fall into budgetary, uh, demise and so I just I just love that 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 photo I, I think we should just do that with everybody in Congress it's like you want to do this or you want to do that just pick a side pick a side and vote on that side and wouldn't that be simple but of course it's not because we have to talk about the the other elements of the bank which is that it is a bank um, and and as Alfaka ha has said and has said tonight it, it is it is a large bank it is a bank that would provide five trillion dollars of financing to a lot of different projects in the local community level on up and, and we know this. And, uh, you know, listening to Congresswoman uh, Ramirez, who is who is new to the process, it's it's just so refreshing that someone can come in and have an opinion and actually vote their opinion right off the bat. Um, that's also, I think, a real positive for um, all the grassroots work that has been done on this and so forth. But I want to talk a little bit about the banking crisis because there is one looming and the fact that this is actually a bank with more um, integrity and due diligence of loans and a lot of other aspects of finance included in the bill um, that we don't always go into all the details um, of on this particular call, but we, we do do that when we, we talk to state level and, and, and federal level Congress people. Um, is that, okay, so we do have a banking crisis that is looming. Um, cash your mind back to a year ago when we had three large regional banks basically actually fail, Signature, uh, First Republic, and Silicon Valley. And a few more actually failed over the year, but nobody paid attention because they weren't as big and they didn't grab the headlines and they weren't um, related to uh, tech loans. But the issue was um, that these banks were facing loans that were deteriorating. At the same time, they were facing depositors taking their money out. At the same time, they were facing the collateral that they held against those deposits and against those loans, which were predominantly treasury bonds, falling in value because the Federal Reserve was raising rates. These three things were all happening at the same time. But the important thing to note is that the loans to begin with, um, particularly with Signature Bank, um, and I'm going to get to why that's important now in a second, um, Signature Bank's loans weren't, weren't great. In fact, Signature Bank was trying to sell off buckets of its loans for six or seven years. And I say that because there is a bottom fisher private equity company that buys up bad loans. It got created in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, actually in 2010. It's called Maverick. And it goes in and it, it hoovers bad loans. Back in 2010, it hoovered up really bad subprime loans, which were predominantly made by regional banks, actually, and then they were bought, bought and leveraged and derivatized by the larger banks, um, and then sort of sold back and forth to each other and to pension funds and to small communities in Norway and throughout the world. That's what was at the bottom of the financial crisis. Same companies are coming up now to buy up bad commercial real estate loans. What are commercial real estate loans? They're commercial loans, 70% of which are extended through regional and, and small community banks across the country. Um, because big banks don't want to really take that local risk of funding commercial loans. And they're predominantly office buildings, 
and multifamily housing units. And stressing multifamily housing units, because one of the tenants of this of the National Infrastructure Bank is that we want to be able to fund low income and affordable income, affordable housing for, for people with lower incomes. So it's all connected. That commercial real estate loan problem is growing and growing. The SEC, because the Fed wasn't doing it and isn't doing it and thinks it's not a problem, has just basically asked a number of banks across the country for more information, more detailed information about exactly who their borrowers are, where they are, how bad the loans are, what the loan to value of the underlying buildings, the collateral is, and so forth, as office vacancy rates are rising and as multifamily rents are harder and harder for people to pay because more and more of their income is going to pay rent and going to pay food. So we have this crisis of credit, which is becoming a crisis in the banking community, particularly in community and regional banks. And this is real and this is growing. Um, and not to get into all of the details, but it's growing by double in terms of foreclosures on these types of loans in just the last year, which not a lot of people are paying attention to. And just 17% foreclosures have increased in the last month. So the trajectory is, is really dangerous, which means these loans, loan portfolios are really uh, delinquent and potentially going to default, which means a lot of small community and regional banks could be failing in the next months to come. What does that mean? It means they're not lending to build infrastructure, certainly. They're not able to lend to build affordable housing, and large banks don't want to be bothered with any of that. So if we look at the actual financial crisis that's happening in another component of the financial system right now, and it's evolving right now, it very particularly is, is at the core of what we need lending for to build infrastructure, which is at the local community, state, and then up through federal level. So the National Infrastructure Bank, by being able to look at loans across a diversity of infrastructure projects that can provide a diversity of loan payments over time and be self-sustaining and more um, safe and secure as a bank is not just necessary for infrastructure today. It's necessary to actually save our financial system. And so this is something that I think is going to continue to evolve as we look at all the important things it can do on an infrastructure basis and also all the, the important things it can prevent on a financial crisis basis. So, so now is, is the time. We, we are really at a critical juncture for so many of those reasons. Thank you, Nomi. As usual, we really appreciate your remarks. Um, now to build on some of Nomi's comments about the banking system, uh, we are fortunate to have with us tonight author and chair of the Public Banking Institute, uh, also out of Los Angeles, Ellen Brown. There's been a huge resurgence of, of interest in public banking around the country, and um, uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to hear uh, about that from Ellen. Thanks, Julie. Uh -huh. Okay, I gotta get my screen up. So I'm just getting over a cold. So <laughs> sorry, I hope I can get through this without coughing. I may just have to read through it. So we're losing the infrastructure race with China. China has spent $1 trillion to build 28,000 miles of high speed rail. Meanwhile, the US has spent, oh, shoot, I can't even see it. 8,000, I think, or 8 trillion, I think it was, for, oh dear, um, I think it was 8 trillion to bomb Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria, yes, anyway, uh, so military infrastructure obviously does not help our domestic infrastructure needs. China is also winning the energy race. China leads the world in renewable energy production and is the world's largest producer of wind and solar energy. It's also leading the world in building coal plants as backup for its renewables when the weather fails. And it has the largest global market for electric vehicles and the, is the lead producer of lithium ion batteries, controlling almost three quarters of the world market. Uh, for decades, the US has focused on high tech industry, outsourcing labor. Uh, then supply chains broke from lockdowns, shutdowns. I think 100,000 businesses were shut down during the lockdowns. Um, Ukraine and Israel-Palestine wars and sanctions. 
Meanwhile, our infrastructure is failing, according to the American Society of Infra uh, Civil Engineers, we need $3 trillion and the NIB coalition says we need $5 trillion and they'll come up with the funding for it. So today the call is to reshore manufacturing, but how do we fund it? The federal debt is over 34 trillion and we're up against another debt ceiling. Uh, with over half of discretionary spending allocated for the military, little is left over for infrastructure and development. 92% uh, of the money supply is created by commercial banks when they make loans, but as um, Nomi and Alfeca pointed out, <laughs> they're not in a position to fund our infrastructure today. You can see from this chart that from 1970 to the present, the money supply has increased by about a factor of 20. And uh, where did all that money come from? It didn't come from the Federal Reserve. It didn't come from the Treasury, according to the Bank of England and the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, I mean, and the Federal Reserve and numerous other authorities. It's actually created by banks when they make loans. So I don't think you can see this chart. But anyway, so when a bank makes a loan, it just writes the amount of the loan into the deposit account of the borrower. So it's created deposits on its books, on one side of its books. So it writes that as a liability to itself because it's going to have to cover um, those withdrawals when the, when the borrower pulls the money out of the bank. And on the other side of its books, it writes that as an asset to itself because the borrower has promised to pay the loan back over time plus interest. But the problem is, as Nomi points out, that um, over 200 banks have unfunded liabilities on their books, similar to the Silicon Valley Bank's books when it went bankrupt. And they have looming defaults, commercial real estate, um, auto loans, credit card debt, et cetera. Even the too big to fail banks are in trouble. The biggest commercial banks are losing deposits, which they need to back loans. And they are the biggest derivative traders. Uh, so if any of multiple black swans that have been threatened for, <laughs> that may be looming this year, if any of them were to strike, they could burst the two quadrillion dollar or so derivatives uh, bubble. Um, and these, particularly these big banks would be in jeopardy. For example, JP Morgan Chase, the biggest has $54 trillion in total outstanding notional derivative, notional value of derivatives and only $4 trillion in assets. So obviously not enough to cover all that if it had to fork over. So rather than trying to cripple Chinese development, we need to cooperate with it and emulate its funding mechanism. And what is that funding mechanism? It has three massive national policy banks, the largest of which is the China Development Bank, uh, for its high-speed rail, for the initial capital investment came from the federal government. This is very similar to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, how it worked. Anyway, initial capital investment from the government. Then funding came from loans, chiefly from China Development Bank, uh, which is not actually a depository bank, but is funded with government-backed bonds. Um, the federal high-speed rail is self-sustaining through something called the fair revenue model. So revenue from ticket sales go back to for maintenance and expansion, unlike in the private corporate model in the U.S., where revenues are pumped back into shareholder profits, for example, share buybacks, buybacks that don't do anything for productivity of the business. So after Feder uh, Franklin Roosevelt's government did something quite similar, <laughs> excuse me, they too were, the banks were bankrupt, the, the many people were out of work, the, the economy was devastated. So what they did was uh, repurpose the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was set up by Hoover. It was not actually a bank. It was just a an agency that was supposed to, um, it was set up to save the banks, but it didn't work for that purpose. Um, but it was based on the Hamiltonian model. Of course, the first U.S. development bank was the first U.S. bank set up by Hamilton and the second U.S. bank, et cetera. Um, it started with $500 million in capitalization, which came from Congress. And then after that, it issued bonds. It wasn't actually a depository bank. So it lent or invested over $40 billion over the next 30 over the next 25 years, funded the New Deal in World War II, rebuilt the depressed economy, and returned a net profit to the government. 
So we need that sort of work around off budget financing, like the Re Reconstruction Finance Corporation and China Development Bank, uh, which can fund programs without legislative approval and without counting toward budget expenditures. So our solution, proposed solution, would be the National Infrastructure Bank Bill, HR 4052, which is designed to be a depository bank, which could create money on its books as deposits when it makes loans. But if that fails, it could also issue bonds as the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and China Development Bank do. Thank you very much. That's all I got. Thanks, Ellen. That was great. Um, I want to remind everybody on the call that you'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end of our uh, presentations. And so certainly there's some time to explore some of these ideas a little bit more fully. And why don't we go to Michigan, um, Saginaw, Michigan. We have with us Michael Balls, who is on the Saginaw City Council. Michael, can you share some words of wisdom with us tonight? I don't know if I have any words of wisdom, but I can show uh -oh. you all that money to come into our city. I mean, we need all the infrastructure fixed here with water lines and we need to get people back to work. You know, I'm, I come from an auto industry. Um, you know, we went from uh, a General Motors plant uh, and now we own 51% uh, by China and other part by General Motors and they're taking our jobs overseas and, uh, you know, thinking that they can build the economy here by may have them make parts over there not realizing mm -hmm. that the people over there ain't driving no cars here, you know, so we need to keep that money here. But I'm interested in the infrastructure bill so um, the inner cities can have people to go back to work. All over America, you know, we're experiencing um, uh, a lot of crime and, and drug trades and things of that nature because a lot of people are not working. You know, uh, it, it, it makes me think that association bringing about assimilation, if you're not working, then who are you hanging with? And, you know, by being a, uh, I'm on the board of directors of a credit union, uh, $1.3 billion credit union uh, from auto workers. And we see that our loans are going down because even our members are not buying that many cars as they used to because they're not working like they used to. So uh, I'm really interested in infrastructure bill to help out the inner city youth um, because I know how to help out. You know, I've been on the board of directors of the Big Brothers and Sisters program for 25 years working with the youth, mentoring. And there's not, uh, when dope come into our communities, we lose a lot of fathers. And that means kids need to be mentored. And they're not being mentored because the father's not there most of the time. So I know that if kids can see their fathers go to work, eventually they'll realize they can go to work too. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, the similarities are there. Small cities, medium-sized cities, big cities, we all have infrastructure problems. So thank yeah. you so much for being here. And I see uh, Representative Benyon uh, ha apparently is off the floor and because I see her there on camera. And so Representative Benyon, we'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, share a few words with our uh, participants here tonight. Great. I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was happy to be able to share a resolution um, for Utah to support the national bill for the infrastructure bank. And it did not receive support in our committee. Mm -hmm. There were concerns that this was tied to ESG or that it would raise inflation. But we have real needs here in Utah. We have had um, legislative audits that find we have $38 billion of water infrastructure needs here in Utah. We have a severe housing shortage and a severe need for moderate and um, affordable housing. So the in National Infrastructure Bank would be a huge help to our state. And just in this week, we've had two bills dealing with um, more investments here in Salt Lake City. We are poised to have the Olympics here in 2034. And we also have a large, um, corporation trying to bring in Major League Baseball um, and an effort by Salt Lake City and the Delta Center owner here of the, of the Jazz to um, build those infrastructures for a hockey team and this uh, Major League Baseball team. Those are each $900 million that 
would be funded through a sales tax in Salt Lake City and other taxes. And those are the one in Salt Lake City for the hockey team would be a regressive sales tax that would hit all people where um, the lower interest that would be found through the Na um, National Infrastructure Bank would be a, a better choice for funding these things that Salt Lake City would like to do in um, updating our, com our conference center and connecting that in a better way to the sports venues. So I can see definite ways that the National Infrastructure Bank would benefit Utah and we'll hope to um, better educate some of my colleagues during the interim. Thank you. Really appreciate your your comments, and it's really good to know what's going on with Utah. What what about the Great Salt Lake? Is it still shrinking? It is doing a little bit better because we had a very heavy snowpack last year, and we're still benefiting from that this year. We're still be adding to Great Salt Lake this year, but in the long term. Um, we need to be conserving more and um, building that infrastructure that is decaying and needs repair. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, okay, so next we are going to go to Illinois and we're fortunate to have with us tonight Representative Harry Benton. He is a member of the Illinois State Legislature. And uh, Harry? I'd like to turn it over to you. I'm a little uh, low key. Sorry, I'm wearing a hat and everything. Uh, I am an iron worker by trade and I was working today. So uh, working my day job and also I'm a Illinois state representative. So this is pretty important to me. I'm looking at 85% of the bridges across the nation uh, need to be repaired. This is what I do for a living. Uh, we we are working on infrastructure within Illinois. Illinois, we have crumbling infrastructure because of winter. Salt destroys our roads every single year. So I'm big on putting members to work and working families, and we're not going to get money out of the budget. Um, it's just not going to happen, not with this Congress. C Congress is dysfunctional right now. Uh, they're not going to put money into anything, and they don't like to pass bills, unfortunately. Uh, what was it, 32 bills last year? So I don't think we're going to get a lot of infrastructure money. Lead service lines are a big deal. We need to replace those. We need fresh mm -hmm. water supplies coming in. Just in my district alone, we have a billion dollars worth of uh, new water infrastructure because the aquifer is drying up. So that's just a piece of it. Uh, obviously, there's sports uh, that the previous representative was talking about. I don't, I don't really care about the sports venues. I've got Jerry Reinsdorf asking for two billion dollars in the the state of Illinois right now, and you know I I hate seeing billions of dollars go to billionaires, but I also don't want to see lost jobs. So, and then if we give two billion dollars to Jerry Reinsdorf, we're probably going to have to give a billion or $2 billion to the Bears, too, that want to move. So it's yeah. just a never-ending cycle, and mm -hmm. I would rather put the money to uh, crumbling infrastructure, especially roads. Bad roads hit working people the, the hardest. You get a flat tire, you miss a day of work. Um, repairs on your vehicles. All of, all of these things hit working people, and I think we need to change that. Plus... This is what I do for a living. This is how I feed my family. And I know hundreds and thousands of other people that do the same exact thing. We need to make sure that our infrastructure is solid. And we need to put that in through the uh, National Infrastructure Bank. So publicly funded isn't working. Begging for people through a budget process is challenging. Very challenging. If we have a little bit more... Uh, independence through this National Infrastructure Bank. I think we could get more projects allocated. I think we could get more projects on track faster, put people to work faster, especially with some of these economic downturns that we're talking about. If we can establish this and come back, that would be good. Plus, it's a, a stable financial investment where 
bonds are kind of all over the place right now, especially with the economy. If you have something secure like this, I think it would be good for investment. In Illinois, one of the things that we're doing, we put out $1.3 billion worth of uh, private funding for infrastructure. And the people that are investing in it is unions. Hmm. The operators invested their pension into it. So they're putting members to work and they're getting a return on their money. And I think that's going to happen across the nation if we establish this national infrastructure bank. So, but I will, I'll end it at that. And I appreciate everybody's time. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you for being here, uh, for being here, Harry. We really appreciate it. And, and I think, you know, one of the themes that we keep hearing over and over is we and Congress have really important decisions to make on where are we going to put our money? What are we going to invest in? And the folks here believe that investing in a national infrastructure bank is a better way to go about it and will yield us better results over the long term. Uh, so now, uh, as we work our way east across the country, I'd like to go to New York State. We have with us New York Assemblywoman Joanne Simon. And Joanne, could you share a few words with us tonight? There we go. Just trying to get myself uh, <laughs> connected here. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for um, to everybody who is on this call. Um, uh, this is, in my mind, one of the most important things we can do to protect um, uh, our workers, our families, our health, uh, and uh, the environment. Uh, here in where I am in New York City in Brooklyn, um, I have a, a tremendous amount of uh, transportation uh, infrastructure, but that also goes hand in hand with um, uh, the environmental impacts, the environmental justice impacts uh, throughout our area, um, and a real lack of sewer capacity. We've had people drowning in their own homes because of a lack of sewer capacity. We have areas that flood routinely. One of the areas in my district is, a, is wetlands, toxic wetlands that were um, subject to a lot of uh, environment pollution by um, uh, uh, gas uh, manufacturing plants in the old days mm -hmm. um, and is highly toxic and is being cleaned up in their building. Uh, but I don't know if anybody saw the front page of the New York Times today. I saw the article online a few days ago. The East Coast is sinking. And um, that is a very big concern. Uh, there are other parts of, of Brooklyn where I know people's homes are about to fall off uh, the edge uh, because there's no there there underneath. So uh, the, the issue about, you know, infrastructure, uh, keeping our um, uh, what the infill, uh, you know, being steady um, and, uh, you know, uh, keeping people's homes uh, uh, is, is one thing. And the, as I said, the sewer capacity that is with, with frequent rains and more frequent rains, more, uh, intense rain. Um, there's a tremendous amount of flooding, uh, along the East coast. Um, and we know that, uh, with sinking and the loss of shoreline, uh, less and less of our cities will be available. Our areas will be available, uh, for development, which will further crowd other areas and really lead to um, uh, a, a tremendous infrastructure needs. So between the transportation, the highways, the bridges, um, uh, the, the sewer capacity, and the desperate need for affordable housing. Um, in my uh, uh, state, we have a tremendous shortage of housing and it's a national issue. Um, and rents are sky high. Uh, there is a great deal of displacement of communities, of working families, um, so that, uh, you know, a lot of labor is getting behind, um, uh, uh, you know, affordability, uh, because it doesn't help them to build new buildings if their own members can't afford to rent. Uh, we can't afford to buy in in the, the, the areas in which they're going to be building. So um, this is a huge issue, uh, and there's not enough money uh, to provide towards affordability to address that issue. In New York, we are losing people because of affordability, not because of high taxes. And um, so the National Infrastructure Bank will address all of those issues. Um, and it is just a time, uh, you know, a, a, I think an idea whose time has come. Uh, the market is ready for it. We're ready for it. Our environment is ready for it. I think 
um, it will make a tremendous difference uh, to everybody's quality of life if we can get this go going. And we don't have to play this game around the federal budget, which we are losing because of either a group of people who don't want to spend anything to help anybody uh, and uh, to build up their, uh, they're happy to take the money if it's provided by, by others, but they don't want to do it, to, you know, do anything for it. Um, and um, this way, we don't have to play that game. We can do this independent of the federal budget process. And it will not matter. The politics will not matter in the same way. And in fact, the politics would probably improve because we can, in fact, address these issues without having to, to beg in Congress for uh, movement, for little bits of movement. So uh, I'm a big fan, as you can tell, um, and uh, I'm happy to be part of this coalition and work with folks in any way that I can to increase the number of people who are on board this bill um, and making sure this happens. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assemblywoman. As always, we really appreciate you being here. Okay, um, our final speaker for this evening is uh, currently living in Pennsylvania. He is a former chair of the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania. He's also spent some time living in Oregon, so he's very familiar with uh, some of our West Coast issues out here. So I'd like to turn it over to Jack Hanna. Thank you very much, party. Julie. Uh, my name's Jack Hanna. I'm a retired attorney of 40 years. Uh, and also have been active uh, for over 30 years in Democratic uh, Party politics, uh, having served uh, in Pennsylvania as the state party treasurer for five years and the chair for six months. I want to talk a bit about the economic and the political consequences of a national infrastructure bank. And uh, the economic consequences of investing in our infrastructure are critical uh, uh, to improving our economic competition with the world at large, including China and, econo and the European economic community. What is infrastructure? 90% of it is owned by state and local government municipalities. They are roads, they are water systems, they are transportation systems, there are electrical lines and the electrical grid. These kinds of investments um, economically provide efficiencies with regard to um, being able to transport goods and services more quickly and provide the services that are necessary for our economy to function. We have not invested in our infrastructure for the last 60 years, essentially. As Alfeca uh, very um, clearly outlined in her initial presentation, we are behind the curve. We have, um, uh, uh, as uh, Alan Brown described, fallen behind China uh, with regard to uh, investing in our transportation system and in our um, energy systems. So the National Infrastructure Bank is a solution to the problem of our running out of money as far as our budget is concerned, funded through Congress, and provides an alternative means for us to make these critical kinds of investments. I now want to talk about the political consequences of this. And what's happened over the past 30 or 40 years is, uh, uh, and I want to, I'm sorry, let me back. Uh, take a step back in a moment and say, I want to talk about investing in our infrastructure from a rural perspective. Um, having uh, um, grown up and lived most of my life in rural Western Pennsylvania, I've seen the uh, the decline of economic um, activity as far as rural America is concerned, and it's created a political rift whereby rural America has become more and more Republican and urban areas have become more and more Democratic. If uh, we are going to have our country really go forward, we need to make the investments and stop ignoring rural America as far as the economy is concerned. And uh, that will... Uh, and if we are able to do that, and if we are able to create a common cause, a common purpose of economic development and making money uh, as far as uh, local, state, national, and international uh, uh, markets are concerned, 
uh, we are going to be able to have a more common cause and unite our uh, uh, country in a way that has a vision that's common going forward. What are the needs of rural America that the National Infrastructure Bank can address? They are significant. Let's start with broadband first and foremost. Broadband is needed in rural areas, not only for commercial purposes, not only for individual needs uh, for acquiring information, but also to teach our students there. We have a deficiency of broadband in rural America. Those of you that live there understand and appreciate that. Well, by having a, a, a true broadband system throughout the entire country, we are going to be, again, creating economic efficiencies. What else do we need? Water and sewage projects, which have just been described previously by several of our speakers, uh, not only in urban areas, but also rural ones. Uh, I was a solicitor for uh, uh, a, 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 a borough municipal of 30 for 20 years and know and appreciate the needs of communities that um, uh, uh, require to have clean water and process their sewage waste. And we don't have enough funds at this point in time through state government and national government in order to address those needs. Uh, the National Infrastructure Bank can provide uh, a, a source of funding in order to address those uh, problems. Lead pipes. Uh, those don't only exist in urban areas, which are a serious threat to the health and safety of the community, but also in rural areas. We need funds by which uh, we remove lead pipes in order to protect the safety and health of our communities at large, especially uh, uh, youth and uh, uh, children. Uh, of course, roads and our transportation system, um, not only uh, roads as far as potholes are concerned in development uh, in order to create uh, faster modes of transportation to um, uh, transport our goods and, and supplies, but also high-speed rail as far as passenger services are concerned, and also our electrical grid that is in the process of being electrified and transitioning uh, from a carbon-based uh, production uh, in order to have uh, renewables uh, uh, rise and um, be uh, brought online so that we decrease global warming. Uh, uh, also, we have... Um, uh, especially in Pennsylvania, but other places throughout the entire country, a problem with regard to gas wells and methane leaking from them, which is a huge pollutant with regard to global warming. Um, uh, it's a significant problem that is an easy fix. We just need to make the investment to be sure that those um, uh, gas wells are uh, not leaking uh, and also being flared, uh, which are contributing uh, exponentially to the increased global warming that we have. Last but not least, also let me just add, housing is also a critical factor as far as rural America is concerned. And uh, it was as it was mentioned uh, earlier in Utah, that's not only the case there, but also in Pennsylvania, uh, and you name it, any state in the country, uh, is now facing a crisis as far as housing is concerned. And the only way that we're going to be able to address that issue is by making an investment in order to have public uh, housing uh, uh, be um, available uh, to the communities at large. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, and I urge you to continue supporting a national infrastructure bank. It is critical this year, it being an election, national election year, that we focus on this issue so that we can unite our country and go forward with economic success. Thanks so much. Thanks. So if you've got questions or comments, please hold them. We are going to get to you. But I, I do want to give everyone a little roundup of some very important NIB information. So we've had a, a, a lot, a lot of activity. And I think one of the things that you've heard in the presentations here is that the NIB coalition and a national infrastructure bank really has a positive alternative to the dysfunction that we have currently in Congress. It's going to give us a different avenue, a different route for our investment that's really going to result in positive results for the country. And so our goal is really to mobilize 
more and more citizens from, from around the country, from each state to talk to their representatives in Congress. So uh, to get them as co-sponsors for this very important legislation. So I'd like to uh, kind of give you a roundup. So first of all, we had uh, mentioned all of the co-sponsors, 27 co-sponsors is what we're up to. In the last Congress, we had 20. So we are adding more and more co-sponsors all the time. Uh, we are, our organizing folks are doing phone calls on a daily basis with folks around the country, legislators, local elected officials, uh, with the goal of getting more co-sponsors. And so really what we have to do is we have to get to critical mass in terms of the number of co-sponsors we have. Uh, in order to get this uh, legislation move forward. So we really appreciate all your efforts out there in, in your hometowns, your home states on moving forward. Uh, we've also had some uh, new resolutions introduced in state legislatures, and this includes Michigan, Illinois, Kentucky, New Jersey, New Mexico, Utah, Wisconsin, and the New York City Council. So as, as you can imagine from that list, this is uh, way across the spectrum from uh, red states to blue states to purple states. So infrastructure is not really a, a partisan type of uh, topic. Uh, everybody drives on our roads, right? Democrats, Republicans, independents. And so our infra infrastructure affects all of us. And we really feel that we can have a bipartisan effort on getting this legislation across. Uh, here recently, we've also had some op-eds in local newspapers. We had an op-ed in the Vermont Community News that was um, uh, written by Vermont State Representative Kate Nugent. Uh, we've also had a press release recently in Wisconsin by State Rep Sheila Stubbs, who also just introduced the resolution in the Wisconsin State Legislature. So again, some very significant advances here around the, the, the country as far as uh, getting uh, more awareness and more attention uh, placed on creating a national infrastructure bank. And so really our goal is to do an all out mobilization to educate and recruit more of our fellow Americans to become supporters of the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, that includes spreading the words by talking to your friends, neighbors and coworkers, emailing, social media, letters to Congress, resolutions, op-eds, letters to the editor, et cetera. And we and our staff are here to help you with that. So um, as you can see, we have our email address there on the slide. And so we're happy to, to work with you to figure out what we can do in your neck of the woods to raise awareness for the National Infrastructure Bank. And I do wanna say that um, all of these activities cost money. Uh, here you see the action page on our website and you see that little red button that says donate on it. And so that essentially is how we raise money to fund all these efforts. Of course, it costs money to run webinars, to have a website and to do the, the constant outreach that our folks are doing. And so uh, we're a totally grassroots organization. We depend on the support of our volunteers and uh, would really appreciate uh, everyone on this call supporting us by going to our website and clicking that little donate button. Uh, also on our action page, you can find information uh, not only on the legislation, but we also have some downloadable flyers and brochures that are available, things that you would be able to print out and take to your local uh, congressperson, your assembly person, or the mayor or your city council. So any of those actions that you might do will help us raise awareness for the National Infrastructure Bank. So um, thank you for uh, paying attention to our slides. And now I would like to go to Q&A. And so I see some folks with their hands up. If you have a question or a comment, um, um, we're gonna, we will get to you. Please raise your hand or wave your hand in, in your, uh, at your camera. And um, if you do have comments to make, let's you know, try to uh, keep them somewhat brief so we can get to everyone. So we are going I think yes. Representative Handy just got on. Oh, is he back on? There he is. Okay, uh, we're going to take a minute and we are, I know I had told you that Jack was our last speaker, but you're going to have to bear with me here. We're going to have one more speaker and that is Representative Art Handy from Rhode Island. Welcome, Art. Hi, thanks. Yeah, so just what I get to do is like be the, oh, oh wait, we got one more person. Yeah, uh, I know. The guy that has to speak before lunchtime. Um, uh, it's always the it's always the pain in the butt part to be, or not the best place. I don't have a whole lot to add, I think, to what we're being said. Um, and I think folks that have been on a number of these calls, we obviously are 
for hearing um, the importance of it. Um, so I was just going to say, you know, so I we're we're working on getting another congressman to sign on here. Uh, the, 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 one of the, I think I think that no no the second newest congressman because um, the uh, um, the new person from New York I think just got sworn in, but um, um, I think. Uh, but Gabe Amo uh, up here in Rhode Island, um, his predecessor was a co-sponsor, David Cicilline. So we're hoping uh, that he will see. And, and he sounded very positive about it. And I know that um, um, some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the volunteers uh, at the coalition have already had a really good meeting with his staff uh, remotely. So I believe he's going to be the, one of the next co-sponsors, if not the next co-sponsor. Um, and up here in Rhode Island, folks may have seen the news uh, not too long ago about uh, I-195, a, a really important bridge, a real artery for us. Um, you know, we're the, we're the ocean state, so we have a big chunk of our state is on one side of the Narragansett Bay and a big chunk's on the other side. And the biggest, um, the, the most important hospital for the state is on my side, the, the Providence side. I live south of Providence. Uh, in a town called Cranston, but over on the other side of the water there, you've got what they call the East Bay and Equidneck Island. A lot of those folks take 195 to come over here every day to go to work. They take it to go to the hospitals, things like that. That Half of that highway was shut down a couple of months ago um, due to essentially aging infrastructure. Um, and uh, we actually just had an oversight hearing with the Department of Transportation um, and I asked some pointed questions, uh, to say the least, um, in part because I'm also a big advocate for transit, all transit, including buses and things like that, um, and why they weren't doing more in that category. Um, but fundamentally, the, the thing to look at, once again, is here's another great example. Rhode Island, one of the first 13 colonies. We have a lot of ancient, ancient infrastructure. I heard what Jack was saying about rural areas. I would say urban areas also are chronically underfunded, as we know, and so, I, and that's where a lot of the people are. And so, I'd say, you know, I mean, I, I, I push back at you a little bit on that, Jack, just to say that I, I, while I agree that we certainly don't want those folks, um, you know, we don't want to have an Appalachia out there. Um, at the same time, we also got to make sure we're we're also bringing up the uh, urban areas into the 21st century as well. I think in many cases, unfortunately, that's not not there yet and i think that, that but but again we have common cause here we've <laughs> the national infrastructure bank is um it's not going to be playing favorites uh it's going to be you know it's, it's going to be something available to everyone to do everything that needs to get done as long as the the administrators and the mayors and the the governors and the legislatures you know get off their butts at least we'll have the money there of course because i can tell you our speaker here in rhode island I've heard him say this at least, you know, our, our annual budget is, is um, I think, $14 billion. He um, is constantly preaching austerity. And, you know, we're a very Democrat state, so lots of Democrats. Uh, it's a bunch of stuff like maybe they're fairly liberal Democrats, but conservative Democrats too. But the point I'm going to get at is he every time is trying to measure expectations and tamp down expectations. By telling us, I have a billion dollars, literally a billion dollars in asks that we do not yet have in our budget that probably aren't going to get in the budget. That's a perfect illustration to me of, of what a fairly liberal state is looking at. So I can't imagine what it's like in other states that may be a bit more um, hesitant to look at spending. And so we really do need something like this to happen. That's why uh, I'm going to be working to get uh, Congressman Amo uh, to sign on, and I'm sure uh, folks in other states are working on their Congress people as well. Um, and bottom line is, I, I will tell you guys as a legislator, you, you want to make sure your idea is on the table when the crisis happens. So let's just keep on making sure this idea is on the table. If, if we can't get it this year, I don't want to tamp up. I mean, I'd love it if we got it this year. I hope we get it this year. But if we can't, that, that if anything, that makes it even more urgent that we make it as viable and available and knowledge known as possible so that everybody's like, wow, we got to do this right now. Just like we did when, when 2000, when the 2009 stimulus stuff, stuff was coming through the, the states that were really able to take advantage of that were the ones that were ready. And we need, we need to be ready as a coalition, as a group of advocates and, and things like that to, 
to, to every time anybody brings anything up, I'll tell you that um, Stu and Althek and others are really good at pointing to every single little hiccup that happens, saying, see, that's where the National Infrastructure Bank's important. We need to be doing what they do uh, in our own state. So let's do it. Thank you, Representative Handy. We appreciate that. I just want to share a little anecdote, and, and that is um, that uh, the organizers, the folks that have been uh, pushing this National Infrastructure Bank um, idea for the last several three, four, five years have really done a fantastic job because they've taken a, a really a pretty complex uh, concept uh, from essentially not a whole lot of public visibility at all to the point now where one of, on one of the last lobby days we had in Congress, apparently people were talking about them making comments like, oh, we heard you people were here. So in other words, you know, the word is getting around that our folks are out there, they're calling on members of Congress, uh, constituents are calling in and talking to their elected representatives. And so we are making a huge amount of headway. And I think that's reflected in the uh, continuing number of co-sponsors that we've been getting on our legislation. So with that, why don't we go right to the questions? Anytime you call you people, is it good summer? That's that I I believe that is what they said. We heard you people were here. <laughs> so, people, that's perfect. That's what you want. I thought it was positive. I took it as a compliment. Let's so go to uh, our next person in line, uh, where the name says it's Rochelle Asher, but I'm not thinking it's Rochelle. <laughs> no, it's John. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I have a question on the banking crisis. Um, it's kind of twofold, which is uh, there's a lot of hubbub now around the Federal Reserve imposing increased capital requirements on the banks. And I was hoping that maybe Nomi could address this, maybe Alfeca, but also as this uh, banking crisis, particularly related to uh, commercial uh, real estate heats up, how do you see that precisely as impacting the prospects for the organizing for the National Infrastructure Bank? Who wants to take that? Um... Know me? Yeah, um, that, that's a really good question. I'll take the second part first, because the reality is there will be banks that will uh, um, either fail or have to significantly sell off some of their loan portfolios or the underlying assets will have to be sold because the reality is delinquencies and defaults are growing um, at a number of, of regional and community uh, banks. Why is the infrastructure bank in comparison a, a more... Uh, secure idea. Well, it's because it can allow for an, an overview of, of multiple um, loans across regions and across projects, and they can basically complement each other in terms of uh, the integrity of their loans. So instead of, for example, a lot of the commercial loan crisis that's unfolding is based on office vacancy rates, which have gone up by 20%, particularly in urban and near urban areas, um, and multifamily uh, home um delinquencies and defaults, which are also at um, pre-COVID or sort of height of COVID levels um, so, and, and increasing, right? So there's there's two aspects of commercial loans that aren't doing uh, well and will deteriorate. So an infrastructure bank allows for actual project financing of multiple kinds of loans that can provide multiple kinds of interest rate payments into the bank. So it becomes more self-sustaining that aren't relying on just that one segment or, or a yeah. sort of concentrated segment of um, of the banks, which currently commercial and regional banks have about 70% of all commercial loans, um, commercial real estate loans in their um, portfolios. So it's the idea of having something that um, really diversifies. And we talk about this a lot with um, Congress people and, and on the calls that we have is this idea that there's loan diversification um, by definition in how the infrastructure bank is, is creating its loan book. Um, as opposed to concentration. So that's just a, a better complement to, to, to the concentrated system, which regional community banks have taken that position over from large banks that don't want to be bothered with those kinds of loans. So again, it's the idea of spreading and diversifying multiple kinds of loans. Um, I hope that also answers the first part of the question, um, but that that's basically um, both why the infrastructure. Uh, no, no, I was bank, asking about I was asking about the capital regulatory capital. It's the same idea. Oh, yeah. So the other part of this on, reg, on, on regulatory capital, and this this is a thing that's always like the poster child for why banks are hurting. Well, because you have to put more money aside in case they hurt, right? So the idea of having extra regulatory capital just means that if you have um, less secure loans or less secure collateral or 
you, you grow your bank. For example, uh, New York Commercial Bank Corps, which has basically had its stock go down like 60% a couple of weeks ago because it basically grew. It took over Signature Bank's loan portfolio. It took over $13 billion worth of essentially bad loans last year. And what that meant was it became a bigger bank. Because it became a bigger bank, it had to put aside more capital as per regulatory rules. And it doesn't have the capital, number one. And number two, it's bought a bad loan book. So, so that's why these things come into play in, in, in the news and regular, regulatory capital raises look like they're the enemy. They're not. They're basically saying that we're putting money aside in case things go wrong. With the infrastructure bank, we're looking at a, a very secure bank um, function of effectively 10% collateral to the rest being loans that, again, are diversified and complementing each other. Um, right now, when you know, Ellen mentioned the, the two quadrillion which is like, it's 2 million billion worth of derivatives that are based on lots of things, mostly in the large banking system, um, which don't necessarily have reserves behind them. So um, the idea of all of this is really to have a more secure bank, um, which we don't have as a large bank system and which can complement the regional community banks. And I'd add, on, I'd add on to that, that, um, that one, the factors that Nomi discussed earlier about what's making uh, banks vulnerable right now, uh, interest rates and, you know, uh, commercial real estate and all those other things, uh, the, the treasuries they're holding on their books, won't affect the NIB startup per se, uh, because, uh, and their, their struggle with recapitalizing because of their past operations also will not affect the NIB. Why? Because banks right now, especially the big banks, do not want to put the, more of their investor money in to the bank to capitalize it because that lowers the profitability of their investments in the bank. Um, the NIB, by comparison, is using a sort of a different model. It's going to investors who are already holding treasuries and would like a higher rate of return, and there's a big pool of it out there, uh, to ask them to collateralize the bank. So that's one big benefit for the bank. Uh, uh, however, a big uh, sort of a, 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 um, a challenge for the NIB will be to attract deposits in a banking system where all the deposits are collapsing because of Federal Reserve policy to reduce the money supply. Um, so we'll have to fight against that. The bank will, the NIB will have to lower its profitability, offer a little bit higher rates of return on deposits to attract them in until such time as it can make loans and increase the money supply. And hopefully that won't disrupt Fed policy to tame inflation. Okay, thank you, Alfeca. All right, let's go to Joe Polito. Joe, you've got your hand up. Hi, uh, great presentations. Thanks to all the speakers tonight. Um, the representative who uh, pointed out that her committee was kind of rejecting the proposal because of inflationary pressures uh, is an interesting situation. And I just wondered if people like uh, Alfeca and Andy had uh, a script that that they could uh, provide uh, a representative in that situation. I mean, I'm guessing you'd say that, you know, it'll mean higher wages for the community and the pace of implementation could be slowed or increased depending on whether there's inflation or, or uh, recession. But uh, it sounds like they need a script. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that comment, Joe. Um, I think we'll go to our economists and ask for a little bit of clarification yeah, look, uh, look. on that. But uh, we believe a national infrastructure bank would be anti-inflationary because it will include, in, increase the supply of goods, increase our productivity. But uh, why don't we give um, Professor Winnick, um, who's on the call, an opportunity to answer that? All right. Just take a couple, couple of minutes on this. One of the key parts of this is that what has to keep in mind that when you're talking about building infrastructure, there are two levels. There are the people who are actually building the infrastructure, building the bridges, laying the track, what have you. But there's a second level, which is they have to have something to build with. They need the steel. They need the railroad cars. They need the materials. Both of these are going to result in, in hiring people to work. So that, that, that hiring and the efficiencies of having that transportation system will contribute to the supply side and increase the ability 
lower costs on the supply side of the people who are using the bridges, using the materials, you, you know, transporting goods. And basically, this does not contribute net to demand. It contributes to the supply of goods over, over, through, through efficiency. So it really is the infrastructure has to be viewed as a necessary thing for new industries to arise. Uh, you know, the, the other thing that is really critical is a lot of this is not so much cost as it is services. When you're talking about, for example, uh, Wi-Fi and broadband, you're talking about education. You're talking about increasing telemedicine of getting medical care to the population who can't drive in a rural setting, you know, 30 miles to a hospital. You're talking about all sorts of efficiencies in the system that reduce costs, that don't increase costs. And that and that's really really a, a, cru a crucial part of the uh, of the ingredient. The other thing is that you're talking when you're talking about affordable housing, you're really talking on two sides. You're talking about who's going to build the housing, and you're talking about who's going to live in the housing. And what, right now we're in trouble on both sides. You know the the we you, you're talking about in, in enabling people to go to work, building all this housing, building getting the materials, whether it's furniture or, ut or utensils or appliances, all those will have to go into the houses. And then you're also talking about taking people off the streets and giving, and the people who are on the streets are not really able to be very productive workers, given their li life lifestyle and their conditions. You get them in housing, you get their, their kids stable, it, it, there's generational effects to this. The point is, this is how you grow an economy. And this is why every other industrial country on planet Earth has an industry has an infrastructure bank. The Euro European Union has them. China has them. Three of them. Australia has them. South Korea has it. Uh, Japan has it. This is how they're building their infrastructure, and they all call it the American model because we started it with with Alexander Hamilton a long time ago. The other thing that's really I think important to understand is there's a stability in the infrastructure bank because of the the way it recycles the projects and the money and coordinate and coordinates them. When we had the re refinance corporation and, uh, you know, that everyone associates with Roosevelt, what we don't remember is it was Hoover who started the, the, the bank, who recognized that that sort of structure was necessary. It wasn't a partisan issue. And, and you know, with, with the infrastructure bank, with all the things it did, whether it was the Hoover Dam, the Tennessee Valley Authority, or building a bridge like the, the, uh, the Bay Bridge between San Francisco and the East Bay, that bank never lost money. It was it was basically in the black for the entire time. So I mean, th this is a viable model. It's been tested. We tested it. The world's tested it, and we've forgotten about it. And my final comment is: there is no alternative. There really is not. You're never going to get the infrastructure bill that exists today was submitted for 3.5 trillion. It came out at half of one trillion. And given the situation in Congress and the budget situation with the deficit, there's no possibility you're going to get the money you need through the federal budgets. State budgets don't have that money. It's not there. Local budgets, communities don't have the money. We either use the National Infrastructure Bank like the rest of the world, or we fall further and further behind the rest of the world. And that's just simply the reality. Thanks, Andy. We really appreciate your expertise uh, here. And I think, Joe, that was a really good point. The, the question about whether the infrastructure bank is uh, inflationary has come up before. And so I think this would be a good topic for a FAQ on our website. So we'll make a note of that. So thank you uh, so much for your input. Okay. Um, we have Diana Smith with her. Yeah, Ellen oh, no. Brown wants to speak. Julie. Okay, okay Ellen. I just wanted to make one comment. I meant to okay. include I was going to include this slide, but my slides were too long. <laughs> so the um, China increased its money supply by a factor of 23, 2300%. Um, and it was not inflationary. The, the price level remained level. And why? Because supply went up at the same rate. Supply and demand went up together. Prices remained stable. Thanks, thanks, Ellen. Maybe we can help you draft that the answer to that FAQ for our website. <laughs> you know? Anyway, okay, okay, wonderful. Okay, Diana, uh, are you ready? You're muted. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Um, I had a question about types of infrastructure, and most of the um, discussion has been about roads and bridges and water and sewage and um, broadband and so forth. 
I think there's also a need for social infrastructure consideration of things like hospitals and schools in the rural areas, because the, the hospitals have been failing in rural areas because they're not getting enough uh, medical support. The telemedicine idea is a great way to deal with some of that, but it's something I think you ought to consider in work into your model because it might be a selling point for, for some people uh, to realize that uh, revitalizing the hospital network and schools in rural areas would be an important way to uh, improve the economy in there. And I'm not quite sure how you would work that, but. Thanks, thank you, Diana. Uh, in general, I think we have a very expansive view. The National Infrastructure Bank Coalition has a very expansive view of what the funding might be used for. And, and I do wanna say that um, our, the concept here is local control. So any state or government entity would be able to apply for financing. So that goes for rural school districts, rural hospital districts, rural uh, water and sewer districts. So they would all be able to apply for financing. And even better, we anticipate having uh, experts uh, on staff at the National Infrastructure Bank that would be able to help those smaller entities in the in their application and the financing process. So Alfeca, would you like to expand on that perhaps? Yeah, uh, both of both of these things, as Julie mentioned, are, are covered explicitly in the bank. One is uh, anybody that comes in for a request for investment in a public good that has a public benefit uh, can qualify for a loan, even if it's not one of the explicit topics that are covered. And then uh, even though I don't talk too much about schools, it's one of the uh, categories that's covered by the American Society of Civil Engineers. And accordingly, we have $250 billion in the bank for schools. I'd like to um, ask uh, Assemblywoman Simon, uh, I believe she's still on the phone, uh, what her experience has been for smaller uh, rural communities, hospital districts, school districts, uh, what their process is for getting financing, and if, if you feel a national infrastructure bank would make it easier and more affordable for them to, to get the financing that they need. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think a lot of what uh, we're hearing, um, and uh, it's it's less within my personal experience, is that they they end up just not not repairing roads and bridges, right? That um, it's very much reliant on county money, on local municipal money, on taxes, on school taxes. Um, so the infrastructure actually falls apart. And so they're always asking for more state funding. And the state, of course, is able to provide some level of funding, but never anywhere near enough. And a lot of it is that sort of budget battle and the needs in uh, areas where there's greater population, obviously, often uh, take precedence. But, you know, the rural areas have a tremendous need for roads and they really don't have anybody helping them except the state, which is minuscule amount of, of help, um, and then locally. And so what happens is they just don't get taken care of. Um, and that is a real problem uh, for a whole host of reasons, as you can imagine. So <laughs> there isn't a, a mechanism for them to actually access funds uh, in the way that would be for the National Infrastructure Bank would be that bank that they could actually access that money from um, at reasonable rates and be able to take care of their community's needs. Let, let me just add, if I may, one real quick point on the school thing. During the time of the Roosevelt administration, there was a big earthquake in LA. 132 schools were declared uninhabitable. Those schools would not have been rebuilt without the Refinance Corporation. That's how wow. all those schools got rebuilt. So they, wow. you know, having schools in the in the concept of what is infrastructure is a long, hallowed tra tradition and won't be a new thing. Thank you, Professor Winnick. Okay, um, let's uh, move through some more of our questions. Richard Royball, you've got your hand up. Do you have a comment or a question? I just have a couple of observations and some questions. Um, I'm a District 1 Director with the League of United Latin American Citizens in New Mexico, and we've worked uh, extensively with our state legislature, and we have, you know, we, 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 we've we got uh, uh, some real good responses from them. We've also had some Zooms with our congressional delegation, which we have some good support. I'll also be visiting uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. here within a couple of three days, and I'll have a chance to drop by and talk to them again. 
Uh, but but I had some real questions with regard to this divisiveness that we have within our political system, and I'd like to try to put together some strategies to be able to move forward with this because right now everybody that's on this call is we're basically singing to the choir, right? So we need to be able to put together something that uh, both sides of our political system uh, can work together and see some positive stuff because it seems like everybody just wants to just, I want to say destroy each other. And that's just, it's just not a good state of affairs. So we need to put together some strategies that when help everybody move forward with this, because I, I know that we have all of these uh, uh, great things that we can do. I think uh, earlier we were talking about broadband, well, you know, the FCC is stopping Elon Musk from using his satellites to be able to get to our uh, places where they're needed the most in rural communities. Uh, it, it's and it's 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 political. It, it's not doing the right thing. We need to get people on both sides of the aisle to look at doing the right thing. And it's just not happening right now. So we need strategies to do that. So this is just a comment on my side. So I, I just uh, uh, in any any kind of um, help from any of our uh, uh, our mentor folks and speakers today that can help us put together strategies to do this would be greatly warranted because I think we could spread this across uh, to a lot of people. Thank, Thank you. you. We, we've been making a huge effort to be bipartisan. We um, we I... reach out to everyone um, to do our presentation. And um, we've done a lot of work with LULAC in New Mexico. We really appreciate the support that we've had down there. You guys have been great. Um, but Alfeca, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Do we have any materials that are really uh, directed sort of a, in a, in a nonpartisan way that could be shared? Yeah, the main strategy that we're using it to is that that infrastructure is bipartisan. Everybody agrees on that, and uh, that we need to so somehow finance the infrastructure in a way that doesn't ding the budget anymore than it already is. Uh, and the way we do that, of course, is the structure of the National Infrastructure Bank makes zero call on the federal budget. So this is a way to off budget finance everything, get everything you need in your particular district, including broadband, including better transportation and roads, including water for where we grow our nation's food, all those things that we're not financing now, uh, we can finance with this National Infrastructure Bank with zero effect on the budget. In fact, it'll bring in more revenues to the budget. So that's been our main sort of strategy. And we will uh, absolutely, when we run into a roadblock like this, U like this Utah um, um, con uh, legislative committee that was worried about whether it would, you know, ding inflation or not. Of course, we we're very sure it won't ding inflation, but we're we're definitely going to develop a slide on inflation and put a fact sheet on our fact sheet. So as we go along, we're building uh, new arguments and you know rationales for the bank, and that that is the strategy of selling the bank as the only viable option for solving our infrastructure problems. It's really important when we call on people who are just not ready right now to sign on board that we hear their objections. And so we understand yeah. what their concerns might be so that we can address them in future presentations and web webinars and that sort of thing. And that's why we really appreciate the comments and the, the suggestions that come out of these webinars. So thank you um, for thank you for being here and thank you for um, throwing that out as a suggestion. Hi, Excuse me. Uh, this is Ed. This is Ed Ungar. Hi there, Ed. Do you have a question or a comment for us? Uh, sure. Just want to expand on uh, Diane's comment several people ago. Um, I was also thinking about, well, daycare. Uh -huh. It takes a road to get people to work. Yeah. Well, for parents everywhere, including parents in the inner city who don't need roads as much, you know, super highways, obviously, that you can see and touch, they still need daycare to get to work. Can we can we look at daycare as infrastructure? Yes. 
That, Absolutely. That is a comment that has come up before. It's definitely something that we've looked at. And I, I saw a statistic the other day that said that um, people who had access to jobs were in communities where there's better access to jobs and to child care, the rate of crime went down significantly. I mean, those are just yes. some basic needs um, that people have. But Alfeca, did, did you want to make a quick no. comment about Michael Wallace wants to speak, Julie? Um, yeah, and we could go with to Michael Balls. He represents a community. I believe you said that you have a lot of working people in your community. What's your take on the need for child care? Uh, there is a lot of ch child care uh, grants available from the states. I can tell you that for a fact because I know people that have opened them up. So there's a lot of uh, federal and state monies available for people to open up child care centers. I know that for a fact. We can. So, hey, can I ask? Um, one of the guys who said he was uh, going to be in Washington in a couple of days. I was wondering what is where he's going to be there. I'm supposed to be there in a couple of days. I just wonder if he's a credit union guy. That's all I want to ask. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we are past our uh, our quitting time. Uh, so uh, at this point, I'd just like to thank everybody for um, being here this evening and taking part in our webinar. Please go to our website um nibcoalition.com and check us out thanks again to all our wonderful speakers and we hope to uh see you all on next month's webinar